Welcome everybody once again to this uh, Towers of Faith lecture. Um, it's a great privilege for me to be able to welcome Jarrell Robinson Brown, Robinson Brown, sorry, who is an honorary chaplain at King's College London, as well as being a postgraduate student at St Melitus College in London. Uh, he is mainly interested in church history, particularly late antique Egypt as well as liberation theology um, and so um, he will be saying a little bit this evening about Shanut the Great is that the correct pronunciation it's actually Shanuta but that's fine because I was Shanuta. calling him okay. Um, years. <laughs> okay I have to admit I have absolutely no idea I have ne never heard of him before okay. you made the suggestion of your lecture this evening so I'm very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say, um, and I, as I'm sure we all are. All I know is that he is uh, rather an elusive figure um, in, in church history and, and has something to say to us, I think, about discipline, if that's what, uh, I believe that's the, the focus of your talk tonight, and, um, and perhaps also the monastic life, but um, I'm sure that uh, you will uh, elaborate on that as we, as we go forward. So, uh, so thank you, Jarrell, for uh, giving us uh, this talk and giving us your, your wisdom this evening. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you. It's really good to be here and thank you for the invitation as well. So tonight's seminar will look at the life of Shanuta the Great, also known as Shanuta of Atreep. And in particular, I will introduce us to aspects of his middle and later biography, but more importantly, his contribution to monastic life in Upper Egypt with respect to discipline and desire. And it is those two, discipline and desire. Many I'm sure are familiar with some aspects of monasticism in Egypt and the Coptic church, most probably through the lives of the desert fathers and mothers and some of the patriarchs of Alexandria or even people like Origen and others. But Shanuta is much more obscure. Some of you might recall the previous Coptic Pope, Pope Shanuda, who took the name of the person we are looking at today. And if you read any of the sermons of the writing of that Pope, you might understand why of all the saints names, he chose that particular name. I think in many ways they shared an outlook which was equally strict and often severe. So I'll now talk for about 45 minutes, hopefully not longer. And um, before I bring us to a time of um, Q and A, I will, does show you some of my favorite Coptic artifacts from this period, um, which I think will help to give more of, of a shape to the context in which we're in. And I'm not an expert on um, monasticism in Egypt. And if I can't answer your question, I'll promise to make a note of it and to get back to you. Monasticism in Egypt has a long and somewhat complicated history. For a start, it is not one thing, it is embodied in a variety of ways, and is mostly understood by its most prominent names, which due to the cost of a scribe and the usefulness of both holy and wayward lives to bishops with often theological battles to win, results in us knowing more about the lives of holy men over and against the many holy women. But what did it mean to be holy in the Egyptian monastic system? What were the real motivations behind much of monastic life in late antique Egypt and in this part of North Africa? And what shaped this unusual way of living in the fourth century in particular? For that, we have to look at one of the most popular names in monastic history, that of St. Anthony of Egypt. Depicted here in a painting by 15 of 1501 by Hieronymus Bosch are the temptations of St. Anthony, often referred to as the father of monks. Antony is one of the first about whom we have a significant record of one who chose to leave ordinary life to live in the desert. In this painting, we see many images, but three in particular that I wish to draw our attention to. The first is Saint Anthony lifted up into the sky, hands clasped in prayer. Here he is tormented by demons, prodded, bitten, whipped and helplessly lying on his back. The second image shows him at what appears to be the end of his temptations, carried in the arms of two monks, fellow pilgrims, we might assume, from the desert. 
carrying their spiritual father who is evidently utterly exhausted by his spiritual experience. But in the center of this triptych, we see the only scene in the entire painting, which appears to be a scene of relative calm, unmoved by the chaos and disaster that surrounds it. Here in the center of this cave, around which the entire world has fallen, is the Christ, not only risen and alive, but Christ pointing to himself upon his cross. This painting then is a good image of how I think we need to approach our understanding of monastic life in Egypt, particularly in our approach towards Shenouta's upper Egyptian context. What is the purpose of monastic life for the Egyptian? In short, the spiritual enemy is both within and without. The world is full of evil and wickedness and sin. The calling of the monk is to flee from the world in search of Christ, a Christ who can be found in solitude, a Christ who can be found in silence and self-denial, as St. Anthony discovered himself when, at the age of 18, in response to the gospel, he left all he knew for life in a cave by the Red Sea. This is a world in which the baptized Christian stands as a child of God, postured against a world ruled not only by the Roman Empire, but more palpably by the forces of evil. And Egypt in late antiquity is a culture increasingly occupied with the relationship between evil and Jesus Christ. Jesus is seen as much as a miracle worker and defense against magic, as he is seen as a savior and the son of God. Where the demons brought anxiety, the monks of the desert offered a remedy for it, namely asceticism, spiritual practice, and life in Christ. Now, the reason I find this painting by Bosch helpful in giving a context to our thinking about Shunuta is because it demonstrates a reality of the ascetic life in the Egyptian desert and the Egyptian mind. That one's commitment to following Christ one's move away from the city into the desert that does not protect you from the very real corporeal that is embodied presence of evil and the metaphysical power of the demonic. Time and again, the monastic life in the writings of the Egyptian monks, whether it is Antony, Macarius, Pacomius or Shenouta, what is described is often described as a battle, a war, a wrestling. We see here in this image by Michelangelo, uh, St. Anthony being again lifted up and attacked by different demons. And in this image, um, in a 15th century French manuscript, we see St. Anthony being shown the tomb or directed to the tomb of St. Paul by a hippo centaur. And in this last image, St. Anthony again being attacked by the devil and by demons in a painting by the master of Bonat. So all of this brings us quite nicely to Shenouta himself. There are a long list of forgotten names in Coptic monastic literature, and the most surprising of these, due both to his contribution to Christianity and monastic life in particular, is that of Shenouta the Great. Of course, in Egypt, Shenouta's name was never forgotten, but in the West, or at least in Europe, we hear nothing of him from his death until 1670. Now this at first seems unsurprising to those who have yet to appreciate Shenouta's contribution to monastic life, but it is even more so when we consider, for example, that he had a close relationship with Cyril of Alexandria and his participation through Cyril in the Council of Ephesus in 431, a council of the church during which both Jesus and Mary's identities were brought into question. Particularly notable is the record that during the Council of Ephesus, having had enough of the bishops arguing, Shenouta, filled with characteristic rage, walks up to Nestorius, the Archbishop of Constantinople, having publicly rebuked him and punches him in the chest to get him to sit down. That Shenouta accompanies Cyril of Alexandria to the council, over which Cyril presides, might tell us something about his prominence in Egypt. But who was this man before that? We know relatively little about Shenouta's pre-monastic life. In fact, it would be true to say that we know almost nothing for certain at all. 
born in the year 347, about 30 years after his birth, sometime around the year 372, Shanuta had entered the White Monastery as a monk. He could read and write in Greek and displayed a deep learning and intellectual brilliance. On this, we believe he came not from a shepherding context, but rather from a prominent family somewhere in Panopolis. Still, we know nothing of his vocation to monastic life, except that he succeeds in it. And in the year 386, Shinuta becomes head of a monastic federation founded by his uncle Picol uh, near modern day Sahag in Upper Egypt. A monastery which he leads until his death on the 1st of July in AD 465. It is from his time as a leader of these monasteries that we have a huge corpus of written works which consists of nine volumes of canons. Those are very specific monastic rules. Eight volumes of discourses, which are um, letters and contributions or thoughts on monastic life. A collection of letters written to the monastery and the sermons which he preached. And then some varia which don't fall into any of those categories. Geographically speaking, we are a long way from Antony's Egypt, which was towards the top of the map in Lower Egypt. But rather as our map here displays, we are now at the other end of the country, further down the Nile. Most of the Desert Fathers were based in Lower Egypt, in modern day Wadi al Natrun, and the communal monastic settings were in Upper Egypt, towards the bottom of our map. The monastery of Pacomius, for example, in the Thabaid, and the discipline of which we will hear more soon was implemented in the monastic communities seen here. The White Monastery, named after its white stone built in the year 442, and the Red Monastery, founded by St. Peshoy, also in the fourth century, again named after its stone color. And there was also a third monastery, which is not listed on our map, a monastery of nuns, the location of which may have been on the site of a pagan temple, which was not an unusual setting for Christian ascetic life. So the monastic federation over which Shanuta had control and was leader was a monastery which was built up of three separate communities. We have the central monastery, which was Shanuta's own monastery and community, the northern monastery, which belonged and was ruled by Bishoy, and the nunnery, which was a monastic community of nuns. Shinuta held the most senior position, which governed all three of these communities. And each of them were headed by a father or mother superior, with all three superiors under the leadership of a supreme father of the Federation. And it was that position of supreme father that Shinuta held. Now here is an image of the White Monastery and the particular area which surrounds it can be seen quite clearly. There's the possibility, as you can see, for agriculture and for other work. Um, and in this next picture, we see the inside of the main church of the monastery where Junita would have preached and where the monks and monastic community would have gathered at least twice a year. And if you look to the left of that picture, you can see the steps to the pulpit. Um, from which Shinuta would have preached, and the pillars and columns still standing. And this image gives us a good view of the surrounding desert, which we can see just above the wall, and the beehive-shaped area of what looks like the beginning of a cloister. And this is a very large monastic um, sanctuary, worship space, with much of the other monastic building not surviving sadly. This is the red monastery. Again, you can slightly see the red uh, color coming through from the brick there, which was headed up by Peshoy and founded by Peshoy in the fourth century. And a picture of the interior of the red monastery. Some of those murals which have been recently discovered and restored by people from Yale University in the States. We have a project to recover a lot of the work that has been lost in this area. 
And here is an image of the kind of site that would often be occupied by monks and nuns, um, an ancient ruin of a pagan temple which would be occupied and repurposed for Christian worship and Christian monastic life. The kind of thing perhaps where the nuns lived. And here is an image of the site where they believe the nunnery to have been located. So just to give you an idea of the size of Shanuta's monastic complex, at one time, it is said to have contained around 2,200 monks and 1,800 nuns, as well as other hermits who lived in and around the monasteries in the surrounding desert. And these are people who, although they didn't live within the monastic building itself, still had a very concrete and deep affiliation to it and had to be obedient to its leadership. It was over these individuals that Shanuta ruled with more than an iron fist. Not only did he find himself in his life losing his temper with Nestorius, he is also famed for the destruction of pagan religious sites all over Upper Egypt. A funny story in the historical records tells of a time when Shanuta and his monks broke into the home of a pagan, removed his idols, before throwing urine at the entrance and pinning an embarrassing note on the door. But it was not all fun and games. Shanuta was responsible too for bringing in monastic punishments that in one particular case were so severe they led to a monk being fatally whipped, not just into submission, but into eternity. By now you might be wondering what turns a monk of any sort into the kind of monastic leader who at first glance resembles more of a tyrant than a loving abbot? The answer is monastic sex. In the early 380s, prior to his election as the Supreme Father, Chanuta storms out of his monastic residence, taking himself off to live as a hermit in the nearby desert. He'd had a sex dream, or more accurately, a nightmare, in which it was revealed to him, presumably by the Holy Spirit, that some member of the community had committed a grave and unforgivable sin, a carnal sin involving homosexual activity. To add insult to injury, the offender was someone in a position of authority in the monastic community, possibly a monk in charge of one of the monasteries within the Federation, and this man was a trusted confidant of the monastery's current father. Not only this, but this homosexual act took place within a band of evil men who were bound to one another by a deceitful covenant. Now this dream was all too much for Shanuta, who felt that it was his responsibility to inform the Supreme Father of the Federation of this grave sinfulness which had taken root in the monastery. Shanuta, believing he was on a command from God, informs the monastic ruler about what had occurred. But the father, Ebon, did not want to believe what he heard, choosing rather to believe the accused who swore innocence and that nothing of the sort could have occurred. Shinuta was utterly stricken by this, and in many ways this proved a formational part of his life. He was not believed, was accused of wanting to be the monastic leader himself, and he felt himself a fool for not keeping his mouth shut, describing his pain as being like a sword thrust into his heart and spirit. At this point, we need to note that this is the turning point in Shanuta's life, because he begins the result of this, having not been believed verbally, to put his feelings down on paper. And it is these letters, sermons and other works, which result in him being the greatest native writer of Coptic in history. Writing to the Supreme Father of the Federation, he writes, if my desire to help you has only brought you more trouble, then forgive me. You are the master of your affairs, and I am the master of my affairs. And I am responsible for deciding to withdraw to the place that God will assign to me. Do not let your heart be troubled or distressed, Father. I will not be an obstacle to you, nor to anyone else in an affair like this. Behold, I declare that if the Lord shows me the way, I charge myself not to eat in company until I go unto God. Now remember the image with which I began, in which I said that the typical understanding of monasticism in Egypt 
is one in which this binary world of good and evil exists. The demonic is real and is something to be fought with and which cannot be avoided. But what do you do when the demons who visited Antony occasionally in his cave on the mountain are found to be residing beyond the monastery walls as members, indeed leaders, of your monastic community? And this is the reality which lands Shanuta in the quandary in which he finds himself. The devil is no longer in the cave, but in the sanctuary. And he has entered the community, not through your own misbehavior, but through the homosexual desire and sex of your fellow monks. He goes on to write in this letter of several pages, the destroyer has come into you. The destroyer has mastered a portion among you and he has taken it captive to a distant land. The destroyer has demolished the enclosing wall of your community, and he has destroyed the choice bunches of grapes, and stripped bare the vines, and ruined the fig trees, and destroyed the pomegranate trees, and the apple trees, and the olive trees, and harvested or replaced their fruit, and let it fall to the ground, and cut down the best of the tall trees in your midst, and destroy the lambs of the flock, and destroy the grown-up rams. For, except that the Lord has left something over among us, we would have become like Sodom and we would resemble Gomorrah. Those of you with a discerning ear will pick up hints of the prophets in Shanuta's words. And that last sentence is actually a direct quotation from Isaiah chapter 1 verse 9. This type of writing is typical of Shanuta, who seems to have a complete grasp of the Bible's cadences and in his oratory, he often blends his words with those of Jeremiah, Isaiah and Ezekiel, telling us something of his prophetic identity and sense of vocation. For Shanuta, the Lord will pour out his wrath upon the monastic community until they repent. And in particular, he will pour out his wrath both now and in the life of the world to come on those who fail to obey the monastery's rules. So this lack of obedience within the monastery, this lack of the control of bodily desire, indeed the lack of repentance of what Shanuta through his dream is utterly convinced has taken place. All of this has real soteriological and eschatological consequences. People's salvation is called into question and the monastic community as a whole is in jeopardy. It's worth saying that this is a particularly unique uh, tone and understanding of monasticism within the history of monasticism. This understanding of the individual being so intimately linked to the corporate. This is not something that we experience in the earlier writings of Pacomius or in the later writings of Benedict. Shanuta sees monastic life as centered entirely upon the discipline of bodily desires. The body, mine and yours, becomes the location of God's redemptive work. Holiness is to be seen in the use and discipline of the body. And this becomes part of his theological understanding, not because he lacks a deep and real faith, but precisely because of his faith in the incarnation and his belief in bodily resurrection, which become tied up with his faith in the salvation of monks through the discipline of the body. The body which you have and live in right now is the body which Christ will raise and the body you have right now becomes polluted through sexual acts through which your soul becomes essentially damned and irredeemable. And if that happens to one monk, it can only spread to all. It's a kind of plague in a monastic life, if you like. Therefore, to have a dream in which it is revealed to you that within your monastic community, there is the possibility for rampant homosexuality in the community of which you are a part is nothing other than a harrowing experience. For Shanuta, the salvation of each individual monk and nun is dependent upon the salvation of the community as a whole. And likewise, the salvation of the whole is dependent on the spiritual discipline of each of its members. This is the first time in monastic history 
that we see such a clear connection between the corporate monastic life and individual bodies. The purity of the corporate body depends upon the purity of the monastic body. Either they will be saved together or they will be damned together. So here begins a new ideology of the communal ascetical life. The foremost obligation of a monk or nun in monastic late antiquity was celibacy. And in no community were sexual transgressions simply tolerated, at least not publicly. Chinuta, however, uses the language of bodily discipline as a language in which he constructs his understanding of sin. And of course, there are consequences for that. In one of his rules for the community, he writes, Cursed be males or females who stare and direct their eyes with desire at the nakedness of their neighbours in their sleeping quarters or have a look at them anywhere else, on a wall, up in a tree, releasing a watercourse, trampling mud, washing themselves in water, sitting down and unconsciously uncovering themselves, pulling down a piece of wood from a high place, working with one another, or filling their white garments in the wash tub beside the canal or by the cistern. And just in case you thought Shanuta was ever lacking in imagination, he continues, or when the siblings who make bread are reaching into the ovens and unconsciously uncover themselves, and whoever stares at them with desire and with shameless eye shall be under a curse. In Shanuta's monasticism, each monk, therefore, becomes particularly concerned with the life of the other because salvation becomes a communal objective. So this is not the monasticism or monastic system of Lower Egypt where each hermit in his or her cell is working out their own salvation. The community are made to monitor the ascetic practice of their colleagues and to report to the monastic authorities and the authorities themselves, particularly in the Red Monastery of Pishoy, made a monthly inspection of the monks' sleeping quarters. But bodily desire is not just controlled by considering sexual misconduct. Chinuta, in his writing, condemning the monastery, chastises the community for the illicit consumption of food and beverages at the refectory. But there is another thing that you did, he said which you did not consider to be a sin. They fled like dogs into the refectory in order to eat and drink on that day, even though it did not please the father, since he wished you to avoid the evils into which you fell. In Shanuta's continuum of defilement then, sin is generally polluting, but sexual sin pollutes in a particular way. And followed by sex in this continuum, we see theft, disobedience and lying as those other things which plague a community seeking to be faithful to the monastic way. So this monk having joined the monastery and we assume having had a fairly positive experience of monastic life before he storms out of it, has a dream which changes everything. He leaves the monastery for a cell in the nearby desert, writing down all his reasons why he left for the monastic leader. Until in 386, he becomes that leader himself. Still living in a cell nearby, but having been elevated now as the Federation's new leader, Shanuta institutes his desired way of life. Broadly speaking, composing rules which fall into four categories. Constitutional rules, liturgical rules, self-authorizing rules, and then specific commands. The constitutional rules are about the general life of the monastery, some of the curses that we have heard already. The liturgical rules are about their worshiping life, how they approach the Eucharist, how many times a day they pray. The self-authorizing rules about each individual monk or nun's observance and then specific commands which are for everyone in every place. And the central monastery which would have been inhabited by Shunuta 
is equidistant between the other two monasteries. And that monastery controls the affairs of the entire federation, that white monastery, including food supply, Eucharistic wine, annual meetings, and visitors to the monastery. Interestingly, the nuns, said to have been Shanuta's most challenging administrative burden, could not do work outside or mingle with the monks. And Shanuta had to persuade them to observe the very same rules as the male congregations. No doubt they occasionally questioned why it was that they too couldn't put a name in the hat, so to speak, for the position of supreme leader. In the writings of Pacomius, who died in the year of Shanuta's birth, purity and desire feature much less frequently than in the writings of Shanuta. And yet Pacomius too was operating a monastic system in Upper Egypt, trying to live a similar monastic communal life with similar Egyptian people in similar monastic conditions. Shanuta's rules inhabit therefore a unique redemptive hegemony which produces monastic bodies, literally, who are both ritualized and constrained in a climate and a community in which desire is despised and even feared. Of course, Shanuta soon learns that he is as unsuccessful as his predecessors in ridding the monastery's inhabitants of their humanity. And so a system of discipline and punishment becomes ever stricter. Each monastery implemented corporal punishment for the breaking of the rules and beatings are often justified as purifying the monk offender from sin. In Shanuta, we see a unique introduction to the monastic system, unique, I believe, in the history of monasticism, which is the discipline of expulsion. If a monk repeatedly committed an offense, they could be kicked out literally and sent away into exile. Worse still, under Shanuta, those who lived as hermits in the surrounding desert could have their hermitage raised to the ground. Shanuta's rules, the canons authorize, leading a group of monks out to the dwelling place of an identified troublemaker in order to remove the monk and vandalize the residents. And we shall cast down the place where he or she dwells, so that we destroy it down to its foundations, so that no, no person shall reside in it ever again, because it might cause difficulty for its neighbour. Now in most forms of monasticism, from its origins until the present day, disobedience requires more commonly a public rebuke, penance, or a demotion in rank, rather than permanent exile. The reason being that permanent exile seems to defeat the whole purpose of the monastic life in which monks and nuns have a lifelong responsibility for one another under the monastic discipline. For Shanuta, however, it is his understanding of the monastery as a corporate social body which allows for the expulsion of community members. The monastery itself is one family which at times, in order to please and love God fully, must forsake one of its members. The monastic community has as its head, God visibly represented as the Supreme Father. Disobedience of the Supreme Father is disobedience to God, who in Christ is seeking to redeem the entire monastic community. Despite being bound together in a community which was to allow the flourishing of community life, there appears at so many points within the Shanutian system a preoccupation with sin and bodily desire. In Shanuta's nine volumes of canons, which were published in English only in 2014, we find legislation which forbids the crossing of legs, the use of oil on the body, defecation in pots or vessels, squatting in public, the removal of bee stings from a monk or nun's foot, the burial of women by outside visiting priests or deacons, the lighting of lights by nuns in pairs, shaving oneself without being commanded to do so, and the visitation of sick and dying relatives by nuns. But added to this, 
there are even more harsh uh, disciplines when we look at the punishment laid down for some of the nuns. For being imperfect in intelligence and propriety, Shinuta lists 15 blows for a nun. For acting on carnal desire, 15 blows. For theft, 20 blows. For quarreling with and slapping the mother superior, 20 blows. For iniquitous deeds and theft, 30 blows. For acting on carnal desire and lying about theft, 40 blows. So within the system, we see a very, very severe ruling when it comes to how people should be disciplined for misdemeanors. Junita writes in Rule 94, and also whoever, whether it be male or female, shall sleep in pairs on a tamat, or whoever sleep at all close together, so as to touch and bump against one another with desirous passion, shall be under a curse. In his composition of the rules, Shanuta implements two punishments, not just for those who commit acts of disobedience, but more importantly, he condemns those who fail to report these misdemeanors. Woe to those who are self-important and conceal some deed among us that is real. And again in rule 108, and as for all among us who see a deceitful deed in the form of a pollution or a theft or any other mortal sin, and do not tell me who it was and what are those evil deeds. All these curses shall come down upon them from God, whether it be male or female. The interesting thing is that he clearly rec recognizes that you don't need to give advice where it's being followed. There's something about Shinuta's understanding of the human condition which shows that he actually almost expects some of these monks and nuns to get themselves into trouble. He sees people as those who have within them desire and passion. And in that sense, you could say he looks at them as complete people. And yet, on the other hand, there is this odd theological understanding um, which seems to think it's, it's acceptable and okay to beat people into obedience. Now, Shanuta, much like his Latin-speaking contemporaries in North Africa, holds, it seems, to a much darker understanding of sin than some of the other people writing in Egypt at the same time. Comparing it in one of his canons to a deep pit out of which escape is utterly impossible, and yet when help is offered, those in the pit try to pull their helper down rather than escaping. At the centre of his thought and theology was the conviction that at the end of all time, we shall be judged as individual human beings and as part of the communities in which we live by the God who is judge of all. The avoidance of eternal condemnation is not something that can be guaranteed. So the dipping of one's toe occasionally in sin is simply not the luxury of anyone who wishes to be saved. It is because of this obsession with sin that the monastery becomes a community under the surveillance of God and the very real surveillance of the superiors. Of course, there was much of the monastic life under Shunuta, which was fairly ordinary. As you would expect within the monastery walls, no one really lived alone, and the communal spaces were the refectory and, of course, the church, which was used twice a week for the Eucharist. The monks and nuns in their own communities would receive the Eucharist under both species, on Saturday evening and early on Sunday morning. Attendance was mandatory and punctuality expected. Even here, ceremonial rules are laid down. The monk or nun's hands are not to be covered as they go up to receive the Eucharist, and the priests must receive before the lay monks and the nuns. The monks and nuns are instructed to meditate while walking to and from the divine office and not to set out too early without a reason. There were five times of prayer in the day, and the offices consisted of psalms and readings, most likely from the lives of the saints. Only two offices a day were gathered offices, and the other three internal offices, said alone, combined possibly with handiwork and communal tasks. 
Again, this was quite a common feature of the Egyptian monastic system. The weaving of mats or baskets, for example, combined with prayer was quite normal, something unheard of in Benedict. For whilst Benedict perceives of prayer and work as being two sides of the same coin, he never really prescribes that they both take place at the same time. So for us in our modern day, all these years away from Shunuta's time, are, they, are there any helpful models or things that we can learn from Shunuta? If I'm honest, I'm not sure that Shunuta offers us any helpful models for parish ministry or church leadership or even Christian discipleship. Despite all the talk that there often is of the priest or the parish priest as abbot, but there are things that we can learn maybe from his deep knowledge of scripture, even if we critique his application of scripture. We might be able to gain something too from his high Eucharistic theology, which took seriously the holiness of both the act of Holy Communion and the spaces in which it took place. Shinuta believed, for example, that the body and blood of our Lord in the mass could bring about the healing of spiritual and physical diseases and that it was more than just a symbolic sharing of a meal. Shinuta also saw the church as a place of healing, where the whole race of Christians, as he puts it, can find the medicines of Jesus, his mercy, compassion, goodness, patience, blessedness, and his love. The doctor, he says, washes out the wounds of the sick with water, but Jesus cleanses the wounds of our sins with his love. But he also goes on to say that it is the works that we do after healing and prayer that truly purify us of evil disease. As regards the priesthood, he says that we are not priests by simply bearing the title and the uniform, but in our sinlessness. It was not because of a title and uniform that Abraham became a friend of God, but because of his righteousness alone. So Shunuta seems to speak at times with moments and a tone of immense mercy and grace. But it always appears to be trapped, it seems, between the conditions of God's kindness. And maybe there is something for us to reflect on in terms of our own theology and our understanding of grace or the role of spiritual discipline in our lives. To close then, it would be remiss of me to pretend as though Shanuta's contribution to monasticism was solely given to us through his obsession with discipline and desire. In truth, Shanuta was a compassionate and often passionate man whose passions led him in a variety of directions. In his concern for the discipline and salvation of his community, he was no different actually to Ambrose of Milan Basil of Caesarea, John Chrysostom, or even St. Augustine of Hippo, in his belief that he would stand before Christ at the last judgment as one responsible for the sins of those under his care. It is easy to gloss over the fact that he was a prophetic advocate of the poor, engaging often in a public defense of their concerns and verbally attacking those who took advantage of them. He would travel to aid Christians who attacked pagan temples and who faced the force of the law. He also, as a preacher, drew a diverse and large crowd to hear him at least four times a year. Pagans and Christians, rich and poor, blemies and Nubians, and even animals. At one point in Shanuta's leadership of the monastery, he opened the central monastic enclosure to an enormous group of 20,000 tortured refugees fleeing barbarian invasion, who stayed for three months, during which over a hundred died, requiring burial, and over 50 babies were born. He also led the monastery in providing refugee support services, protection and even ransom, using his connections with those in high places and the financial resources at his disposal. And the monks of Upper Egypt, whilst often found terrorizing pagans, also organized an ambulance service, carrying and nursing the wounded following invasion. Shinuta was even offered the opportunity to receive Episcopal ordination and become a bishop at the hands of Cyril, but he refused, preferring to remain a monk. 
just before he died, having lived mostly in a cell on his own and having led the monastery almost 80 years, corresponding through emissaries and visiting only for the Eucharist and occasional offices. Shinuta rejoins the community he loved more than anything, now in a state of poor health and in old age. And he says, I want to remain among my brethren, the children of God and the children of my fathers, for us to promit, profit from each other. It's as though his community, although imperfect, suddenly becomes in his eyes and heart that community into which God has placed him. And he suddenly sees that although they are imperfect, they are truly his brothers. Shinuta died desiring nothing other than the will of God in the company of Christian fellowship on the 1st of July in the year 465 AD at the age of 110 years old. His contribution to Christian orthodoxy as well as his contribution to monastic life deserve, I think, to be much better known. And I hope that this has shed just a bit of light on at least one very small aspect of his life and work. Thank you. Just before we come to a Q&A, I wanted just to very briefly show you a few things um, before we come to questions and answers, if I can. Um, so these are some keys from the White Monastery, which I saw in Egypt last August in the Coptic Museum. Um, and you can't really see, but on these keys, the name of Shinuta in Coptic is written and also the name of his successor, Besa. And there are also dolphins and leopards um, carved onto these keys. And that's quite interesting um, for reasons which will become clear in a moment. Here is one of my favorite Coptic artifacts. It's a Coptic censer from the sixth century. Um, it's made out of bronze and it was discovered at the monastery of Epiphanius. And as you can see, a lion has its claws in the back of a hog, and there's an elephant also on the front of this censer. And what this shows, shows us is that actually Christianity held on to a lot of the symbolism of paganism um, in North African Christianity in Egypt for quite a long time. This is the sixth century um, after Shinuta, and after all of that, strong rhetoric against paganism, and yet a lot of the things which we find um, show this symbolism. And this would have been used presumably in Christian worship in the monastery, and it's designed so that the incense comes out of the mouth of the lion and the mouth and ears of the hog. Again, this is a Coptic amulet um, from the sixth or seventh century. It shows on one side a woman in prayer, um, with her hands in the orange position. And on the other side, uh, the woman caught in adult, caught, not in adultery, gosh, the woman with the uh, issue of blood, sorry, is depicted um, touching the hem of Jesus' garment. And this is made out of hematite stone, um, which was believed to stop uh, any blood issue. It was believed to have healing properties, particularly um, related to blood. And this presumably would have been worn by a Christian who was a practicing Christian, but also believed in the healing properties of this stone and, and possibly in uh, magic properties from wearing such an amulet. And there are many of these which exist in Coptic Christian uh, Egyptian history. And lastly, this is a fragment uh, from the White Monastery in Egypt, which has details of the life of Shinuta depicted on it in Sahidic Coptic. And it's these fragments which enable us to know things about the rules of Shinuta's monastery and the kind of life that uh, existed there. And most of the fragments which exist in the world now, funnily enough, are at the Bodleian in Oxford. And there's one fragment at the British Museum on display from the life of Shinuta and many uh, fragments at the British Library as well. So I just wanted to show those to you to show um, some of the things which exist from Co Coptic Egypt and which connect us to the life of Shinuta. And I will now shut up and stop sharing my screen. <laughs>
Well, thank you very much indeed for your, your um, lecture this evening and introducing us to uh, Shinuta the Great and his monastic life and discipline. I always think there's nothing quite like hearing about uh, the monastic life to give our own spiritual life a bit of a kick up the backside to remind us of all the things we perhaps could be doing and should be doing uh, to in our own circumstances. Um, I remember first reading the Desert Fathers and one particular story stood out which was a monk traveling down the road and he sees in front of him uh, a group of nuns coming towards him so he does the honorable thing and crosses over to the other side of the road so he doesn't come into contact with them at all and as they come level the mother superior strides across the road to him uh, goes right up into his face and says if you were a true monk you wouldn't have even noticed that we were women um, yeah. and uh, so that there was always this sort of this sense of of continuing in this discipline and, and the framework that that provides and what I thought was really interesting was the the, the element that that this has to occur, there has to be an element of communal living and um, and of the repent, repentance and and that, that forgiveness and discipline leading us through that together. It's not just something we impose upon ourselves in in silence, but it, it has to be tempered and and held by by the community, um, both both to spur us on when we would be too soft on ourselves, uh, but also to hold us back when we are our own worst critics. And so that's a it's a really useful reminder for us that even the hermits would return for the Eucharist and would uh, still have that connection with their community. They, they, they were not alone in that in completeness in that sense. Uh, so again, thank you very much uh, for this evening. We will uh, have questions in just a moment, ably emceed by uh, Father Matthew. But just to give you a heads up while you're all still here for next week's lecture on the 10th, uh, same time and same place, we have uh, the Right Reverend Dr. Graham Tomlin, the Bishop of Kensington, who will be speaking to us next week on Martin Luther and scripture. So please do uh, join in for that one as well. Uh, and now we'll hand over to questions. We have plenty of time if anyone would like to dig more into the life of Shinuta the Great and uh, monasticism. Thank you very much, Father Sam. Uh, so I can see you all on gallery view, which is really helpful. So if you have a question, just raise your hand or send me a message in chat. It's quite a hard one to to kick off. Who's going to ask the first question? Father Alex, I'm, I'm, I'm looking towards you, obviously. Uh, surely something must have, um, that must have raised some really interesting uh, thoughts in your mind. I guess so. I, I mean, the thing is, I mean, it's, we were talking about discipline and um, I, I guess we always think in the rule of St. Benedict how, uh, you know, he's, he's far more gentle um, and, and much more balanced, of course. Um, but um, I suppose it, it, it brings to mind the fact that this was a hard way of life. This is not this is not running away from the world in any uh, any sense of the uh, of the idea, you know. Um, okay, we might think that. Uh, I suppose if we compared the the Desert Fathers to sort of later monasticism, the the later monastics had it easy, really. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's definitely something that. Um, I think I had to write something recently on pre-Benedictine monasticism and I didn't realize um, how much there was to actually get through. Um, and it was looking at all of, the, all of the monasticism before Benedict, basically. And I suddenly realized and came to the conclusion that I think Benedict was only so moderated or moderate in his monastic discipline because I think he made a conscious choice to not go down the Egyptian route completely because he wasn't ignorant of it. Um, so it's not that Benedict just chose the, light, the lighter path for the sake of it. I think he was consciously making a decision um, to not be that severe because I think he saw its flaws quite, quite clearly. You know, and he had a link through Cassian um, and through many others. And if you, you know, when you really do begin to un analyze the monastic order of Benedict, you can see all the time hints to a deep knowledge of what, ha what was happening in Egypt. Um, and of course, through, through Cassian, who lived in, in the Egyptian desert for seven years, possibly longer, and knew many of the desert fathers, um, we, we know that there's a very clear link between Benedict and, and a lot of the desert fathers. 
and possibly even the monastic community of Shunuta. Um, and whether Benedict decided to make a very clear diversion from that path isn't known for sure, but I, I get a sense that he did. Um, and also you have a deep practicality in Benedict's monasticism that doesn't exist in some of the um, other forms of monastic life, you know, um, for sure. Uh, thank you very much for that. And, and, and uh, Father Alex, I'm very sorry for, uh, uh, for, for leaping on you first day, but I, I, uh, I, I knew that you'd forgive me. <laughs> thank you any other questions uh let's uh let's see uh angela i can't hear you you're muted i'm afraid sorry <laughs> and again Still muted i'm afraid father angela there we go okay that fixed good lovely um Thank you for a really stimulating lecture on Shanuta. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, of great interest to me is the way that he's deeply concerned that the sin of the individual matters to the community. Mm -hmm. And I think this sort of sense of caring very deeply about the corporate is something I feel is often absent from parish life, where we can go weeks on end without seeing anybody or knowing where they are. And I suppose I'm, I'm wondering, um, in a way, you've, you've partly answered the question whether there are other models which would have Shanuta's same care for the corporate without the same sort of obsession uh, and strictness over certain sin. But secondly, why it was that Shanuta wasn't um, to a certain degree restrained by the, the rest of the community? How is it that, that such a harsh, what seems seem to me anyway like a really harsh level of discipline for quite minor infractions uh, wasn't sort of highlighted by who are whatever the equivalent of the safeguarding people is <laughs> yes that's a fantastic those are fantastic questions i'll answer the second one first because i think that's um easiest the first thing why wasn't it restrained i think um it's really important to know that not only did they have vows within this community, but everyone at the door of the monastery made an oath um, to the Supreme Father of the congregation. Um, and that was an oath which was taken very seriously. Um, and if you didn't want to live that life, and if you broke the rules, as I was saying, you know, you would be expelled out into the open. And if you think of the context in which we're in, in this time in late antique Egypt, um, the, the alternative, so if you're not a monk or a nun, the Roman Empire probably want you to join the military, which is not much fun. Um, that area is being invaded all the time. There are plagues, um, deep poverty. So actually, unless you come from a wealthy family, the options are not that great. So actually being in a monastery where you're being ripped and beaten, um, only when you break the rules, it might not be that bad a thing, actually, in comparison to, you know, the other options. And within the monastery, you're fed, um, you're watered, you're surrounded by a wall. Um, you have brothers or sisters, um, you're, you probably have access to books because there'll be a library and, and other things. So as, as harsh as it is, and this is the, the crazy thing for us, I suppose, um, actually within that context of late antique Egypt, the other options were not great. <laughs> so I think that's probably one of the reasons. Um, and the other question was about parish life and any other models, wasn't it, I think. Um, so the monastery of Pacomius, strikes a good balance. So you have in the Monastery of Pacomius, which is nearer to the, the Nile, um, something more similar to what Benedict had in mind um, and what Benedict builds on later. So you have a monastic community, usually within one particular building, um, with a kind of abbot figure and much more regulated patterns of life and a life in which much more is shared, um, where there are no hermits really, you're all in a kind of communal setting. Um, and where that kind of discipline and expulsion is not heard of. Um, and it was also a monastic system, Pacomius's monastic system allowed for other kinds of labour, so you could do farming, and they owned a fleet of boats, for example, um, to go up and down the Nile in Pacomius's monastery, which they would hire out, so that would earn money for the monastery. Um, and Pacomius doesn't have the same problems with desire or the same kind of obsession with sexual desire that Shanuta has. So he's able 
to write and to focus much more on their communal prayer life and worshipping life um, and on that balance of life together, which I think we just don't see as much in Shunita because he is so obsessed with the body <laughs> and with what people are doing with their bodies um, that you just get this harsh reaction to, to that. Um, and I think that I, you know, someone in modern times who writes on our shared life together is probably Bonhoeffer comes to mind um, in his little book, Life Together, where he basically makes the point that, you know, there is no such thing as individual sin almost. What one person does in a religious community does affect us all because, you know, if my own um, discipline and discipleship is not in good shape, that affects my relationship with you and that shapes, that affects the community. This idea that what I do is my own business, Bonhoeffer would say is nonsense. And I think Shunuta would agree with that. And I think in parish life and in our life together as Christians, um, that, that is worth reflecting on for sure. I hope that's kind of helpful in a way. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question and the answer. Is there, is there another question in the room? Uh, Hannah Lewis. Thank you for that. I was really interesting. Like most of us here, I'd imagine it's not someone I've heard of before. One thing I think that I really struck, and I may be doing a modern reading back into um, back into this, but the this focus on sex and sexuality is a kind of really bad thing for what were probably called reasons at the time but in a modern experience where that comes out in other monastics throughout church history and in a lot of modern experiences so that kind of focus on sexuality as being bad can often lead to this severe self-hatred which is not something that's of God. I'm just wondering have you any thoughts on that in um, the life of that monastery, or whether I'm just being a bit too modern. No, no. Um, I think, so one of the things that I'm really interested in in my research in Shunuta, and there's so much that I want to look at, is is there something to be looked at in terms of his his acceptance of the fact that that homosexuality exists, and that there are some monks for whom this desire is real, um, is there something is there something positive to be gained from that? I, I want to say yes, I think, um, for his understanding that that this exists in the world. He's not living in denial of, of that, I think. And I think there is something healthy in that. When I think about conversations around race and sexuality, um, with you know, there are so many conversations which um, like to articulate something of the fact that homosexu homosexuality is an African, for example, or that it's 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 not a black thing. <laughs> And yet here in the fourth century of Egypt, we have North African monks um, for whom homosexual practice is happening, you know, and homosexual desire exists within the monastic system. Um, and there's also something to be said about comparing Shunuta with other writers uh, who, who don't obsess over homosexual desire in the same way, I think. And I think, I do think there is something positive to come out of that conversation um, when often we talk as though this is the first time the church is encountering issues <laughs> of sexuality actually you know in in Shunuta's time um, issues of of sexuality in terms of um, LGBTQ questions are are there there's, there's questions about what it means um, to be someone who is part of the gay and, and LGBTQ community, I think. And there's something very powerful also about the idea of understanding the bodies of women, of nuns um, within that as well, and of their own sexual desire. And we do hear you know, stories within the Egyptian monastic system of um, monks and nuns who, if you like, present you know, there, uh, there's a story of a, of a woman who joined a monastic community of men and it's not discovered that she is actually a man until she dies and the monks are um, preparing her body for burial and they suddenly realise that, that she was a man all along. Um, she was a woman, sorry, all along. And there's this whole kind of discovery and there's something there about 
um, how we understand gender and the questions about that within the religious religious um, community, I think. Um, so definitely, that wasn't a very articulate answer, but I definitely think there's, there's benefit for today from there. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, Roland, uh, do you have a, a question? Yes, I was astonished by the, um, the size of the monasteries. So on the one hand, the one was 1,200 people, and the other one, I think, 2,000 or something. Was it, um, was it exceptionally big for them? And if it was big, was it seen like a, a cult, a mass cult that people just flocked into? What about that? Well, it's really difficult. So there are two things um, about that. Pacomius's monastery was said to be incredibly large and um, something ridiculous. I mean, uh, 65,000 monks or something is, is what Pacomius is said to have, have been dealing with. Um, and of course, with a historical hat on, looking at the context and thinking again about some of the things I said at the beginning around bishops who used to um, document the lives of holy men to kind of argue sometimes theological cases. Um, I think we need to be careful about how, how we read some of those numbers. Is, is there something about um, Christianity in a context where paganism is still a problem trying to you know, show itself as being bigger than it really was. Um, the physical buildings, though, of, of the White Monastery, you know, that, that really does prove that there were people to fill that space, presumably, because they built it. Um, and that, that means that there was probably very likely a very large monastic community there, and the Red Monastery itself was huge. Um, so I think there's, in Chinuta's case, there's, there's definitely something to be said for believing um, some of the large numbers. But in some of the other cases within Egypt, I'm, I'm a bit more hesitant because I think we have to remember um, that we're dealing with a church which was under persecution and which actually knew that in what it was writing down, there was a lot of propaganda as well, um, which means we have, to, we have to have that hat on us as we, as we look at these texts and read these things. So I'm not completely sure whether we can trust the numbers, but I, I, it is remarkable. Um, and we know that Shunuta was a fantastic preacher. That is definitely without doubt because there are records of people going to hear him. Cyril of Alexandria, um, you know, was willing to make him a bishop and really believed in his ministry. Um, and I can imagine actually that it's true that people flock to, to hear Shunuta. Um, and when I read his sermons, you can, you can almost feel the oratory in them. He knew how to construct a sermon well. He knew how to pick up that tone of the prophets. Um, so it's believable that some of those people came to hear him preach and maybe join the monastery. Okay, Father David? Sorry. You've muted yourself, Father. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so I, I hate reading these guys <laughs> because it, you know, you feel like a religious tourist, right? Because it's such a foreign world. So my, my, question is very uh, contemporary. How do we, like it's really easy for us to look at these ages and say, oh my goodness, they were so austere, they went overboard. And we can look at Benedict and say he was, as Alex said, balanced. And I, I think Alex is right, maybe proved by so much history that Benedict's idea actually worked. How do we look at our own age clearly? Mm -hmm. How do we know whether we're actually decadent or we, I think we like to think of ourselves as balanced, but what if, what if, like, how do you actually look at your own age, the age you're in and think, wait a minute, when I look back on Christian periods in the past, they seem so austere, but wait, there were actually millennia of that austerity. Mm -hmm. And here I am smoking cigarettes drinking scotch, probably going to have a dinner later, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. How do, how, do, how do we know, are we, are we the decadent? Mm, mm. Are, or are they austere or are we decadent? I don't, I don't honestly know. Like, how do you measure that? How do you see clearly? I think that is, that's a, a, it's a very tough question, actually. I think the beauty of history is that it does keep us honest. And one of the things about, you know, really reading, 
you know, not just the lives of the saints. If we can read, for example, the life of St. Anthony by Athanasius, and Anthony becomes this absolutely, you know, blem blemish-free saint. Um, but then when you read <laughs> what Athanasius was trying to do in his own life as a bishop, um, it makes you look at what he's saying at, about Anthony quite differently. Um, and then when you read what other people say about Anthony, you know, you have a bit more nuance, I think. Um, and some of the things which we might hear Anthony say about himself or the wider context of some of the Desert Fathers. Um, so I think when, when I look at the whole, the broader context, I feel a bit more encouraged because I realise that um, a lot of these monks and nuns were just complete failures. And that's why they were monks and nuns, because everything else they had tried to put their hand to had failed. Um, and even out in the desert, often they were failing. You know, St. Macarius um, was was accused of, of getting someone in the village that he was near pregnant and he had to, that's why he fled to a cave because he was being chased. Um, they eventually found out that apparently that wasn't true. But I mean, we, we can forget those, those bits of these saints sometimes and just see them as they are in icons. Um, and I think there's something really important about holding them as human beings who are seeking a better way of life. Um, but who, who I think were deeply human, actually. And that's, that's, that's why so many people went to them, I think, because they, they saw perhaps a, a deep humanity in them, not just holiness. Um, we assume often that people went to Antony and all these people because they were drawn by their holiness. And I sometimes wonder if actually there's, there's an attraction to their human side, to their humanity, actually, which was deeply attractive to um, and I think, how, how, do we, how do we read our own time? It's very difficult. I would agree with you. I'm not sure I have an answer for that. <laughs> you know, I think it's very difficult to know. And you can read these, these texts and feel like a complete failure in your Christian life because they just sound so perfect, but they weren't. And this is why we have monastic walls, because people were breaking them all the time. <laughs> um, and I find that slightly encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. No worries. Okay, so I have a question from Charlotte, and a, I have a written question from Kevin, which I'll read for you, and then I'm going to come back to Father Alex, who's raised his hand with a with a with a <laughs> an actual question rather than me putting one on him. Uh, but if uh, if you'll forgive me, I have my own question, and so I'm going to insert it at, at this point, which is. Uh, is, is there something special about North Africa at this time that means that this kind of monasticism is particularly attractive to people? Because when I think about the Celtic saints in the, in, in the UK, particularly in Wales, Justinian on Ramsey Island and St. David, for you know, Justinian particularly as a hermit, who was beheaded by his own brothers for being so strict. I mean, admittedly, he then picked his head up, walked across the water to the mainland, put it on the ground and a spring came up. So, you know, there was some forgiveness there in, in that. But is this something about the physicality of North Africa that makes this kind of, to us, uh, very strict discipline more attractive, do you think? I think there's no there's nowhere like the desert. I mean, if any of you have been to, to Egypt and been out to the desert, it is a very different place that like, there's nowhere like it and and I remember when I, I went first to the monastery of St Anthony and looked at the cave where Anthony said to have lived and just thought I, I kind of get why someone could come here and and forsake the world I can't do that and I don't feel called to it but I can see how that can happen um, and I can also see how that can drive you to all kinds of hallucinations and all sorts because the desert in you know I went in August which was the the hottest time, the worst time to go to Egypt. And, you know, I've never felt heat like that before. Um, to live in that condition, out in the desert, you know, with no AC, no easily accessible water, all the things which might make life a bit easier, um, I can see its attraction. And there is a kind of silence out there in the desert that doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, and I can imagine people who just go out there, who went out there to see some of these monks, um, who had no reason to kind of return home being very pulled by that. Um, so I think there's something about the actual terrain of North Africa. But also Egypt, for some reason, just had lots of people very early on, you know, before St. Anthony, he, he wasn't the first monk um, or the first hermit. There were many who, who were living this life 
um, from the pharaonic times out in the Egyptian desert, um, who did it well. And I suppose that part of North Africa is just soaked in, in people who have been doing that. And it's a very different kind of monasticism to what you see in the Greek system or in the Syrian system. Um, the Egyptian system has always been praised from its outset as being the best and the most, um, well, the most perfect kind of monastic practice. Um, John Cassian said that, Benedict knew that, um, and I would argue that the Celtic monastic system um, is, is entirely based on the Egyptian system, and we can see that particularly in Ireland. Um, it's unavoidable. They even found um, a manuscript in Ireland which was made out of papyrus in a bog, um, the Fadden Moor Psalter, which is really fascinating if you, if you look at that. Um, of course, papyrus does not grow in Ireland. Um, there are lots of people, myself included, who are looking into links between Egypt and Ireland, um, even prior to St. Patrick's arrival there, um, because of some of the things that have been found in Ireland. Um, so definitely... and, and much the same in Wales as well, which is which is why I'm asking the question because it, it, there seems to be such a deep connection, in particularly that sixth century expression of monasticism, yep. um, in 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 Wales uh, and and in Ireland and, and in Scotland. So thank you very much for asking that. I'm going to go to Father Alex next because he has told me that this question is is his question is connected to this, and then Charlotte, I'll I'll come to you afterwards. Yeah, I was just thinking uh, when Father David was mentioning um, the sort of, you know, why, why did they withdraw into the desert why, and why was it so? And I wondered whether if there were, is a, a sort of a similar connection with the growth of uh, new monastic communities and, and emerging communities, um, uh, whether there is a sense of um, we are actually... Uh, in a time where people are dissatisfied with the way the world is. And I think, I think particularly, you know, sort of the people who have um, realized, particularly in this time of lockdown, for instance, uh, they've um, gone to a, a more disciplined prayer life. They've rediscovered it. They've, you know, uh, particularly um, a rediscovery of the love of the, um, the office uh, and so, so the Psalms and all that sort of thing. And I wondered whether there was a sort of a, a sense of similarity um, it, that actually in our own age, this is why we're seeing sort of a growth of these new, new sort of outpourings of monastic spirituality. Definitely, I would, I would say so. Um, we see in, you know, if we take St. Anthony's story to be, to be, you know, as, it, as it's told to us, um, he is unsatisfied by life. Um, the same with Benedict, he's dissatisfied by life. Um, unlike, you know, Benedict, unlike Anthony, had options. Benedict was all set up to study and, and you know, go down a, li a line of studying rhetoric in, in Rome and all of that. Um, he had a bright future ahead of him. Um, Anthony, not, not maybe so much. Um, he hears the gospel, uh, Matthew's gospel, and just responds to that. You know, Jesus saying, sell everything you have and give to the poor um, and follow me. And, and he acts on that. And I think there are many um, people who, not just to monastic life, but to priesthood and to all kinds of uh, ministries, um, be it lay or ordained, who express something of that dissatisfaction with life um, and are often inspired by those they've discovered who are living life often with much less um, but appear to be much happier. And I can imagine the challenge of, you know, knowing there are these people out there in the desert who are living this life, and you hear stories of them being content and being quite happy with this life of fasting, prayer, solitude. Um, and that, that gives quite a strong challenge, I think. You know, I, I often think we need, you know, it would do so much to the church and the world if we really had an Anthony or Benedict or, um, you know, Mary of Egypt or someone who just up and went out there. Um, and I know there are hermits around, but often we don't know much about them. Um, but I think it would be, it would be, it would send quite a powerful message. And the other thing, of course, of that time when Antony goes out into the, into the desert, is we often forget that Antony and Constantine are contemporaries. So actually, you know, the context within which 
um, Anthony goes out to the desert, changes. Suddenly Christianity is quite popular. You know, you've gone from Diocletian to Constantine um, and suddenly, you know, Christianity is the emperor's religion, um, kind of. <laughs> and all of a sudden, um, you can imagine it becomes something that's not only popular, but, but seems safe because you have much of the empire behind you. Um, and of course, that doesn't stay that way, but for a long time, it's, it's okay. Thank you, Gerald. I'm going to go to Charlotte now, and then I have a written question from Kevin. Charlotte, over to you. Thank you. It was a really fascinating talk. Um, to, to sort of deepen the historical context, you drew a, a comparison or, or a distinction between um, Shanuta's monastery and one, I think, in, in Lower Egypt. So two questions. Um, first, how typical was uh, Shanuta's uh, style of monasticism, as it were, of, of that, of, say, Upper Egypt? And is there a general um, distinction to be drawn between monasteries in Lower and Upper Egypt? And, and if so, like, why might that be? So there is, and it's quite an interesting thing. So they're, they're separate in geography. They're separate in terms of being um, Lower Egypt, in Wadi al Latrun, is, is hermits, eremitic life, anchorites solely basically not now but it was now you do have communal life um, the monastery of saint anthony for example and saint pishoy and macarius all of those are communal monasteries um but they're separate also in language so in in lower egypt you have um Bahiric coptic which is a different coptic to the coptic of um, upper egypt which is sahidic coptic and they are very different and again so that divided the um, relationship between them as well um, which is really fascinating so whilst they were aware of each other and were in communication um, that divide of language had quite a big impact and also um, because of the nature of the desert in Lower Egypt you know you can be a long way from the Nile in Lower Egypt um, so actually to be a communal monastic um, house or setting is much more of a challenge and if you wanted to have any kind of agriculture you just can't do that in Lower Egypt, it's impossible. Um, whereas in Upper Egypt, where Shanuta and Pacomius um, set up their communal monasteries, there's some greenery, there's the ability, because of the Nile and the, the nearness of that, to, um, to farm and to do other things. So I think that's, that's also, also a difference. Um, and you're a long way from Alexandria in, in Upper Egypt. And again, depending on what your motives are and what kind of connections you want to have, that also makes makes an impact. Um, does that answer the question? Was that was that it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Okay, I see no other virtual hands raised, and so um, unless there is another another hand raised in the uh, in the the next uh, minute or so, we will say that this is the last question, and it is from Kevin. Uh, and uh, Kevin would like to know was. Was Shanuta only writing for his only communities or for a wider readership? And if he was writing for a wider readership, who was that readership? Right. Um, so Shanuta was writing directly to the monastery, but he was also a political mastermind. He wasn't stupid. So the reality is he knew that he had an audience and he knew that people respected him and were listening. And he also had... Um, the ear of the Pope, you know, the Bishop in Alexandria. So um, I get the sense that when he writes on things like the Eucharist and when he writes about Jesus Christ and when he writes about worship, um, he knows that the Bishop of Alexandria is watching that. He knows about the councils that have taken place and the fact that there are all of these um, conversations happening. Um, and if you want to be kind of left alone to get on with what you're doing in your monastery, it helps to have the Bishop behind you. I imagine that a lot of what he's saying and doing, he's also doing with a, an understanding that there are lots of people who, who are listening to him and who know who he is. Um, but the reality is the letters and the sermons and the rules are written for the monastery and for that federation. Um, he's also building on the rules that already existed. So he doesn't completely scrap the monastic rules that were in place from his predecessor. Um, he builds on those, he makes them much harsher. Um, and and a lot of the sermons 
he knows that, you know, part of his audience four times a year, as I was saying, were pagans and other people. So he's, he's preaching to people probably with the, the hope to convert and to encourage them, um, you know, to give up paganism and consider Christianity. And clearly it worked. Um, and he's constantly in contact. We have, you know, letters have been found between um, Shanuta and Cyril of Alexandria. Um, they had a very close relationship. Um, so I imagine that that is, is also part of Shanuta's mindset. And originism is rife at this time as well. Um, and all of that is factoring into Shanuta's mind, who is, you know, a brilliant theologian. He knows his scripture and he knows how to bring all of that together. And I think when you read him, you, you read and can tell that he's, he's speaking with the other audience in mind, for sure. Well, Joel, thank you so much. Uh, it's, uh, I think this is one of, those, uh, one of those talks where the talk was fascinating in and of itself, but the questions have really opened it up as, as well and made it, uh, uh, really brought it to life. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for your, uh, your, your expertise your, uh, and sharing your wisdom with us this evening. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for We're all clapping away. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, just to say, everybody, we will see you all again, same place, same time next Wednesday, as we join uh, Bishop Graham, as he talks about certainly my favourite theologian of all time, Luther. So join <laughs> us next week, Bishop Graham, seven o'clock next Wednesday. Good night and God bless. Thank you. Bye-bye.